Dave, it's Klinger hey. in uh, Chicago. Hey, how you doing? Good, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for the time. No sweat, man. Nice pad. Um, wow, look at you. Nice fucking plant. plant. That thing's giant. What is it's that? Real. It's an elephant ear. Wow, you're a botanist. My wife is. There you go, dude. What um, else you got growing in there? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I just I took everything that was appropriate for the interview and made sure it was in the frame. And let's just talk about the fact that uh, the things that maybe you used to do recreationally as a little kid or as a early teenager, maybe that's one of the things. Perhaps. I don't know. I'm not telling anyone about that. Dave, your book is, well, first of all, I don't, I'm not a fan of audiobooks because... Joe Schmo narrating a book isn't necessarily a voice I want to listen to for 400 pages. So that being said, when I knew that your voice with your personality was reading your own book, well, I bought that copy for me. I bought a copy for Jan, which is my mom in Atlanta. And uh, so we have started maybe three or four um, uh, chapters in. Uh, driving from Raleigh, Durham to Pinehurst this past weekend in North Carolina for a wedding. So we got into it and it's incredible, dude. And I'm not, I, I guess I should have told you, I'm not trying to kiss your ass, man. This is Dave fucking girl I'm talking to. And the storyteller reminds me of being a scrappy little kid. I had the tough skins. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, where there's a hospital there called Providence. Well, my first name is Josh, Josh Klinger. And my parents called it Josh because I was always getting into some trouble. So I appreciate these stories that you have articulated um, into a pretty spectacular book. And I do want to say congratulations um, on you've got a number one spot on this book already. Yeah, yeah I was, believe me, I was surprised. No, listen, I mean, it, I did, you know, I'm looking at like, you know, Bob Woodward's Peril, like that, that's yeah. the number one book. I'm like, well, mine's just this stupid thing with a bunch of stories about being a dumb little kid who loved rock and roll or whatever. Um, so I was surprised, you know, who's was most surprised, my mom, who was a creative writing teacher, public school teacher for 35 years. I'm the guy that drops out of the high school that she taught at. And so I got to go over to her house and go, bam, and drop the book yeah. in her lap, just like, wee. But Sick. anyway. Well, she, I mean, here's the thing. She always, she's so cool and she always has been cool. She's, you know, she really sort of gave me the confidence and gave me the faith in myself that I could do something like this. Plus my dad was a writer too. He's a journalist and a speech writer in DC and stuff. So um, no, I mean, you know, I, I didn't expect to get like a number one New York Times bestseller because I just imagine that was for real books. You know, I didn't think it just like some silly memoir, whatever. Um, so, so I was, in, I was really surprised. I really, it's, really was. Dave, it's funny. It's funny to hear you say, yeah, I thought number one spots were for real books. Um, I'm kind of glad that you articulated it that way because real stories are what I think drive so many of, of us. And when I say us, um, you know, I, I, I was telling Gabby before the call, like, so I'm on a lot of radio stations for iHeart Rock and, and just trying to keep the rock alive. Um, making a fire is killing it, by the way. I heard. That's so nice. Yes, yeah, it's cool. And I feel like I am really good at speaking or asking questions on behalf of our listeners, man. So when I say, you know, oh, or when you say, you know, the book is, you know, number one spots are for real books. No, this is real life. And you're telling real stories that a lot of us can relate to, whether we're rock stars or not. Yeah. Well, here's the, you know, it really all begins. I'm not, I'm not just saying this from that time. I saw a band at the Cubby Bear in Chicago, right across the street from my field, that band Naked Break. Band. It really begins there because before then, you know, like I listened to Beatles, I listened to Zeppelin, I listened to Kiss, I listened to Rush, and I had those posters on my wall. Yeah. But that didn't seem like I loved the music. Yeah. But it was hard for me to relate to that, like as a human being. I mean, they seemed like cartoon characters or they seemed like yes. superheroes or something. So when I went and saw Naked Reagan at that club, I was like, oh my God, like they're, we're wearing the same tough skins or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there's two amps on stage and, a couple lights and just some people in the small room. But when they started playing, I realized like, oh man, I could do this too. And so I think that of all the things I've been trying to do in the last like 
10 years or so, it's to really kind of humanize the whole process or experience like Sound City. That was all about like getting in a room and hitting the tape and just playing with your friends. Sonic Highways, that was all about the regional aspect. And it's just people that make these cities music capitals. And then what drives us, the van documentary. That's like people getting in a stinky old van and playing little clubs because they just love to do it so much. So when you're when I'm writing these stories, it's really like, I mean, there's no like American Idol moment where it's just like, yeah, you know, you're just doing it because yeah. you can't live without it. And it doesn't matter if you're like eating corn dogs or sleeping on floors or, you know, it doesn't matter. You just have to make the music. And so in writing the book, you know, it's really as simple as that. And I'm sure that most musicians have the same story where they fell in love with music they tried to figure it out on their bedroom yep. floor. They found some friends, they put a band together and they just worked hard at it because they love to do it so much. It doesn't seem like work. When you really love it that much, it's not work. You're going out and jamming with your friends and screaming for three hours. Like I've had shitty jobs. Like this, this one, this is, <laughs> I'm trying to keep this one. But yes. yeah, I mean, that's the whole thing is I'm sure as you're reading it, you can relate to a lot of these experiences because you know, we're just people that love music and that's the deal. I'm so glad that you are articulating these stories in in that way. Um, you know, we don't have a ton of time. I, man, I wish we did, but you're busy and you got shit to do. Um, but really quick, what is the short answer of why write this book? Because I've read that, hey, the pandemic hit, but wouldn't the pandemic give you an opportunity to step away from music, rest your voice, get family time in, you know? Yeah, no, I'm fast. Really I'm a spaz, dude. So spaz. do you ever, so there is a second question there. When does Dave Grohl recharge and reload and take a freaking break? You, like maybe once every few weeks, I'll go out with some friends and I'll get blind drunk and it's great. And then I'm okay. just like, oh, gotta get back to work. No, I mean, you know, it, it really was a matter of timing that I finally had a moment where I could okay. sit down and write these things where you know, I used to keep journals when I was young. I, I had these like really detailed journals of yeah. like touring with Scream and touring through Europe and stuff like that. And I lost them all. But, um, you know, I was offered to write a book maybe like 10 years ago. And okay. two, two reasons I didn't want to do it. One is they said, well, you just do four or five hours of interviews. Someone else will write it and put your name on it. I was like, oh my God, my parents would disown me again if I did that. Yeah. But then I also thought like, well, I don't know if I'm, you know, I don't know if I'm ready yet because I don't have enough, I don't have like life in my pocket. Like it's time to like, let's do some yeah. more stuff. And I'm glad yeah. I waited, but really it was that I needed, I wanted to feel creatively fulfilled when the band wasn't doing anything. But then also, you know, I wanted to be able to document as much as I could before too long. So it really was a matter of timing. But that being said, having done it, uh, I had so much fun doing it that I want to do it more. And 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 Foo Fighters are still on tour. We're still playing yeah. shows. Yep. But every day I wake up and I'm like, I already know the first line of the next book. It's in my head. Did you know, Dave, did you know, I love the fact that we're just having a conversation and I can just be like, hey, Dave, like, sure. You understand it's a big fucking deal for me to be talking to you. And it's not a big deal. You You make everybody around you feel cool and comfortable like no big deal dude um that was more of a statement i wasn't really asking well no i mean that's the thing is i mean whenever i get to meet someone who i've i've grown up listening yeah. to their albums yeah. or have learned their songs when you meet them in person it's it's a weird experience because for the first time you're experiencing like the flesh and bone you're like now it's 3d now you're face to face yeah and uh you know at first it's like a supernatural event you're just like oh my god this is real what's happening but then you know it's reassuring because you you see that um oh they're you know joan jett is is a person she's cool man and you're like face to face with her and you, you're flashing back to the first time you saw the i love rock and roll video or the runaways but then but then you realize like wow, she's, she's just cool, man. And yeah. then you, I mean, you never forget who these people are, you know, when, when you're, when you're face to face with little Richard or Paul McCartney or David Bowie or Prince or something like that, you're face to face with them. It's like having an out of body experience because you're watching yourself meet yeah. this person and it's really weird. So I think a lot of, a lot of artists, um, 
they understand that that's happening and okay. and they really try to reassure you like no man it's cool like you know we're just hanging out i feel like this is cool like you're not gonna hang up and say man that clinger guy was a total douchebag you know like no i just you know no, you're just super cool did you know that you were going to narrate the book that you were going to do that right yeah. off the whip when you started this project well not when i started the project i didn't know anything about writing a book or recording an audio book i had no idea how any okay. of this stuff worked yeah, until yeah. It, we started talking about the audio book and i thought well i mean i wrote the book so that the reader would imagine I was telling them these stories. Yes. So writing in your own voice is kind of the way I like to do it, whether it's like the cadence of a sentence or a certain emphasis on things. You know, I feel like it has to have some sort of almost rhythmic or, or musical uh, pace to it, the story. Yes. And I wound up like writing in, in the kind of a specific format where I would like begin the story with a punchline. And then you you write the rest of the story, and then at the end, yeah, uh, um, you know, you you sum up everything, the emotional relevance of why this is important to me. But um, as far as the audiobook, dude, my schedule is so bananas. I had three days to do it, and so and we were like oh, rehearsing man. and playing shows and blah, blah blah. So I walked in there, I was like, "Once upon a time," like my voice was so <laughs> destroyed that I looked at the engineer. And I'm like, are you sure this is like, am I Tom Waits right now? Like, is this okay? And he's like, no, 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 it's great. It's your voice. It's your voice. It's great. So there's there's chapters in it where I'd like, you know, we rehearsed until 10 o'clock the night before. Then I walk in, I'm like, once upon a time, I joined Nirvana. And I'm just like, oh my God, what am I doing right now? But it was, but the, the crazy thing about that was when you're writing these stories, you know, I didn't write the, the book in any sort of chronological sequence. I was just like, writing a short story, sending yeah. it to my editor, writing a short. So when I read the book in its entirety from front to back, actually hearing myself say it, it was a trip because there are things that I wrote that I've never said before. And then I, and then I say these things, it's coming out of my mouth and it becomes like really real. And it was, it was, it was a, a it was a very emotional experience. It was great. I can imagine that because you're telling true stories. And when you, you know, when I'm speaking to somebody or reading a story to my niece or something, it can be a little bit emotional. So if they are your stories and you are the one narrating the book, I can understand you really kind of do a deep dive on those emotions, right? Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, you know, it's weird. When I was a kid, I used to do this thing. I only remember this a few years ago. I did this thing where I had this cassette player where I'd listen to music before going to bed. This little thing I put on the windowsill and then like hit play and fall asleep listening to punk rock or whatever then i started putting blank cassettes in there hitting record and talking about like my problems and then i would rewind it and hit play and fall asleep listening to myself talk about my problems <laughs> you see my mouth right now i'm just like yeah it was weird i don't even know it, it, it doesn't sound weird to me though and it's 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 interesting it was one of it, I mean, I remember telling my therapist this once and she was just like, oh my God, you're insane. No, she was like, that's, she's like, that's good. That's good. You're yeah. like, sit. and this was sort of the same thing with this audio book. As I was, as I was reading these things, I'm like, oh my God, it's like when I was 13 with that Radio Shack cassette player in my bedroom. You know, to hear that, Dave, makes me so excited to sit down and listen to chapters four on. A again, we were at a wedding, we flew into Raleigh, Durham, then drove to Pinehurst. And we were in our rental car and we were listening to the first couple of chapters. And I swear to God, it was like my wife and I are just gathered around while well, we're driving, but the radio hanging on every word because it's so, it feels so relatable, yet not and when i say not it's like dude I, I don't know what it's like to be in front of fifty thousand people fall off a stage and break your leg right i don't but now i kind of do because you're so detailed with your stories and the way you're telling that story um and it, and it, i know we have to wrap up but it makes me wonder what it was like when you called your mom to tell her you broke your leg because I remember you said, you know, your daughter was sitting on your lap as you're wheeled into the, the hospital. And at that point, you knew how your mother felt 
yeah. when you were a little kid and got busted in the head by a golf club. Well, yeah, I mean, here's the thing is like one more injury, my mom would be like, oh, God, would you do this time? Yeah. You know? So, yeah. I mean, that's the thing is one of the one of the most uh, one of the most beautiful pieces of advice my other my, my mother gave me was um, she once told me you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. And so that really resonated with me in that moment. Like I said, in the book, I didn't feel any pain. I felt my daughter's pain because she was scared, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I focused all of my energy on making sure she was okay. Like, yay, we're gonna, they're gonna take a picture of my bones and yay, they're gonna push, let's take a ride on a wheelchair, you know? Um, you just listened to I wanted to make story. sure that she was okay. And so I'm sure my mother probably would have felt the same, but at this point, she's just kind of like, really? Yeah. You fell off the stage again? What what, what, what happened this time? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know we have to cut this conversation short. I hope to uh, to take my 79-year-old mother to a Foo Fighters show in the next year. That is uh, a birthday present that I got her earlier this year, but because of COVID, she's kind of in Atlanta waiting on, on stuff. You know, she's a little nervous at that age. Yeah. Um, well, if you need any help, we, we have that like mom section on the side of the stage. <laughs> we just put the moms over there. I love it, dude. And congrats. I just read that Sir Paul McCartney is the one that's going to induct you guys into the uh, hall. So thank, thank you for your time. Thank you for the stories. And let's get some more people to buy this book and uh, and hear your voice telling some pretty epic stories, dude. Thank All you. All right. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, See dude. you around. All right. Bye.